Hi everyone, I'm Elie Pasqualis from the Casus Belli military group in uh, Bologna and today I'm here with Professor Istvan Giarto who will, excuse me for the pronunciation of his name oh, <laughs> and the uh, professor is a lecturer here in the Etvostlorand University in, uh, in Budapest and one of his main theme of interest, I think it's uh, microhistory, so uh, it will be the main theme of our interview today. And uh, I would start from a quote of you in one of your previous work, in which you talk about a useful uh, approach that historians should follow, mixing macro-historical perspectives with micro-historical cases that should uh, be useful for uh, of course, go more deep into the uh, framework, into the historical framework, but even test the macro-historical uh, theories. For, so, my first question for you is, what is micro-history nowadays? Is it an instrument? Is it a methodology? Is it a different discipline that historians should use, mixing it with others? So, yeah, please. <laughs> so, uh, I think that uh, it is useful to start with the beginning. And as you know, in Italy, that uh, microhistory was an Italian uh, school of history from the 70s, as microstoria. But it has been, uh, um, it's become fashionable worldwide. So now uh, it's much more than that and much less than that. Certainly there is no school of microhistory and I think that there are a lot of historians who apply microhistory in a certain stage of their careers without considering themselves as uh, microhistorians. Uh, in my understanding, microhistory is characterized by three uh, important uh, elements. The first is uh, quite natural, it's a microanalysis. Without that, there is no microhistory. But I think that microhistory aspires to something more than a case study. So microhistory is doing a microanalysis with uh, the intention to give the answer for a certain great historical question, some general question. And finally, the third element of my definition would be agency, that uh, microhistorians or microhistorical works put a stress on individual ag agency. They do not see past people as um, puppets on the hand of some macro forces or structural forces in history, but they are active in a microhistorical narrative. So, uh, um, I think that this kind of an approach, so not the Italian school of microhistory, but this microhistorical approach can be applied to any kind of uh, history. So now I would say that uh, anyone who uh, feels like it can use this approach in his or her field of history, doing research in diplomatic history or economic history or whatever. But uh, there is one uh, field of history, uh, military history, where this approach is uh, clearly uh, very advantageous and that is military history. Because uh, in military history agency is really crucial and microhistorical works really show this individual agency in military history. It is not um, by chance that the very first work that had microhistory in its title, it was uh, George R. Stewart's Pickett's Charge, a microhistory of the final um, attack at Gettysburg, uh, in the Battle of Gettysburg, um, published in, I think in, uh, in 1959 maybe, uh, I have, yes, 59. Uh, that is uh, not only microhistory, uh, according to the author, but uh, military history, evidently. And um, you mentioned um, that uh, in an article written in Quaderni Storici, actually published in Italy, uh, I argue for a possibility to blend microhistorical. Um, uh, approach and uh, make historical uh, narratives because uh, very many uh, among historians are skeptical about microhistory because they do not believe that any micro investigation can lead to a general uh, statement to an answer to a great historical question because it's really 
kind of um, debated if it's possible or not. I think it is. But for those who think that this is not possible, still there is a way to use microhistory. Because if they use cases embedded in their narratives, when the backbone of the narrative is given by a mi micro uh, insight, but uh, to this narrative, lived stories of living people uh, are added, they then um, give the narrative uh, a color that is otherwise uh, absent from it, that the living people and their fates and their actions are present, their experiences, lived experiences added to a general narrative. For example, um, Joan Ferraro has written about divorces in, um, in Renaissance Venice, late Renaissance Venice, uh, because, uh, you know, actually divorce was not possible in the Roman Catholic uh, country, but in fact it was in the form of uh, marriages being declared null and void. And um, this is a, a book that it has a general statement, but uh, in the narrative you have uh, dozens of real uh, persons with their stories, how their marriages uh, uh, went and how they, these were annulled uh, at the very end uh, in front of the court of the Patriarch of Venice. In this book, for example, these short stories give a completely different character to the whole of the book. And such, uh, such a, a cooperation of micro-narratives and, and uh, micro-investigations uh, can be found in military history too. And um, unless you have questions to ask... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, because in, in some part you have just um, respond to, to my to my question, but um, yeah, I, I would ask you um, the my, my second my second question for you is that uh, more cl going more close to the main topic of our uh, group that is uh, of course military history. Uh, I would ask you how would you decline this approach that you uh, talk about uh, now in the specific um, field of military history. Uh, sorry for uh, stealing your, your questions. And, yeah. You know, I'm a teacher and I just start <laughs> speaking and I go on, go on and, and yeah. stop after five, no 50, 45 minutes or 90 minutes or so. So, um, yes, so we are now at the point where it's uh, possible to argue for a certain type of military history that has uh, microhistory, this approach, embedded in its narrative. And I think that the best examples for this are um, the books of a, um, a British and the book of, um, of a Swedish author. The Swedish is uh, Peter Englund, who wrote about the Battle of Poltava, the book you know yourself. And the title is, I think, The Battle That Shook Europe, uh, Poltava and the Birth of the, uh, yeah. of the Russian um, Empire, or Russian Great Power, either of these. Um, so here we have uh, a story, quite uh, traditional in military history, a decisive battle is uh, being fought close to Poltava in the southern of the Ukraine today, uh, between uh, the Swedish and the Russian army. And uh, there is nothing, uh, well, from my point of view, I'm, I'm not a military historian myself, so nothing interesting in itself, but the way it is written this book uh, becomes more than just military history. There are uh, dozens of, uh, of short uh, deviations from the main narrative of the uh, bell, uh, giving the, the reader information about those who fought the battle, what happened to them, their fates, their, their lives. And that is something that brings uh, uh, this uh, early 18th century event close to a, a 21st century reader or late 20th century reader, as that book was written in the 20th century. Uh, so uh, it is essential uh, for any book of history to have an appeal to readership. And I think that the genres of, of biography and military history uh, are quite popular within history itself. But still, even for military history, I think it's useful to explore this, uh, um, this asset to work together with microhistory and make the military historical narrative much more, um, much more vivid, to bring it closer to the reader through the uh, fates of those who fought the battle.
And the Zamoyski book I mentioned as, as another example, he is the, uh, the British author I refer to, is about uh, 1812, um, Napoleon's fatal retreat from Moscow. Or at least that's approximately the title of the book. Uh, is again something in which you have a macro narrative. This was a, a campaign that was born under a bad star. It shouldn't even have been started. So Napoleon made a series of mistakes. There were structural causes that this ended as a disaster because uh, Napoleon was used to Western European warfare where distances were short and the population was dense and quite rich. And when he went to Eastern Europe, he met just a different world. And his tactics and his ways of uh, waging a war just didn't fit uh, the terrain. So there were structural causes and Napoleon made causes on the level of, of leadership. But then if you go uh, and read the book, uh, the, the narrative of, of Zamoyski, you realize that every single officer, general officer and individual soldier just made the little mistakes that all led to the uh, to the fatal uh, end of this condemnation in, in Russia. So everyone was forming through actions or through uh, omissions, through not doing something important uh, to contribute to this, to this end. Okay, thank you. And my third and last question for you is if you want to uh, talk about uh, specific military micro-historical case that, in your opinion, is um, more relevant or that you find for some way uh, more interesting than the others? Well, I mentioned these three books and I think uh, in each of them you can find a narrative that is uh, uh, different from usual micro-historical narrative in Stuart's book, in uh, Anglin's book and in Zamoyski's book as well. And uh, maybe a, a last and fourth case can be mentioned, which is not a book of military history. Orlando Figes is a British author who wrote about Stalinism, the family's life under Stalin, in a book uh, which title is uh, who, the title of which is uh, Whisperers. And in that, there is a section on Second World War through the eyes of one uh, single writer, um, Simonov, Konstantin Simonov, who who later wrote the influential fiction on the, on the Great War, defending the homeland, as the Russians called the Second World War. Uh, and here again, you have a, an approach that is um, adding new colors to the usual uh, genre of, of military history, that, um, that sees a war uh, not, not in the form of campaigns, and it not just something that can be shown on maps, but how individual experience uh, really characterized uh, um, these uh, decades or these years. This is more or less a trend in, in military history in itself without any influence from micro history. If you think of Keegan's uh, The Face of, of, of Battle, then you have this attitude of having a look at war from uh, below, uh, from the point of view of the common soldier. And this is something um, that can be explored really deep with the help of the approach of micro history. Okay, great. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for your time, question. And I remember that uh, we of the Casus Belli group, uh, you can uh, reach us on the main platform, so uh, in the main page of Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, uh, t uh, of course, for the video interviews. And thank you again, and see you next time. Thank you.